Awesome. Thanks, Rupert. Okay. Um, so thanks, Rupert, for starting the recording. Um, and then the other two new people uh, joining uh, Link Digital, Kate and Kevin, are both in Philippines, um, joining our business services team there with uh, Karina and Sook, who's on the call as well. So Kate's in marketing, Kevin's in sales. Um, and the idea is we just really want to kind of get our message out there and, and make sure that we connect with the right organizations that need the kind of services we provide. Uh, they're focusing on that. Uh, we still have Phil and, and Talitha working domestically in Australia in this sort of area on um, sales and marketing as well. Um, so this forum, it's essentially a place for discussion. So you can raise topics. There's no sort of limit. The idea is just to sort of you know, think about who's in the room. Link's obviously a company that does uh, open data services. So um, a lot of our customers will be in that space. Uh, we do web dev services as well around Drupal. Um, so there'll be those sorts of topics. And so web experience, UX, UI, um, but also just the, you know, the, the domain topics surrounding that are, are obviously interesting. So whether that's government service delivery or whether it's um, you know, bringing together as we'll talk about today, um, civil society, uh, what do we want in our societies and how can um, government be improved to support societies or how can societal you know, groups be improved as well? Um, and the format is just to raise your hand. So in the bottom where the emoticons are, you can click on that, click to raise your hand. Whoever's speaking, if we have like a formal set of speakers, uh, they can either take your question straight away or they can bank them up and wait to the end of their they're, they're sort of like bit and then take them uh, one one by one. So that's the idea. Um, and we can go on because um, the stuff that I'll talk about, um, I've got some slides for that, but I just wanted to introduce the folks from uh, Pacific Community, CEO, Stan and Leo. Um, they're going to talk about uh, work that they've done there, the portal itself, uh, tech stack stuff. Uh, Talitha's worked with them on, on what the <laughs> brief is. But the main thing I'm, on, I'm, I'm keen to hear about as well is just that tomorrow is kicking off their database challenge. So um, it, it's a really cool event that um, I was involved in, or not minimally involved in last year as a sponsor and a judge. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it had some really good outcomes from last year. So I'm keen to see that succeed again this year. So I will I will kick out of this and um, let you guys jump in with your topics. All right, thanks for that, uh, Stephen. And um, Stan is driving our presentation slides for today. And I'm just going to open up with um, an introduction and uh, some context about who we are, what we're about. And then Stan will talk about the technology platforms, what we're doing um, uh, in that space. And then Leo will, of course, talk about the uh, data list challenge. And we may even invite uh, Hoisty, who's also joined us from the Caledonian government. She's uh, our partner in the data list challenge. Um, so we'll, we'll get straight into it. Uh, my part will be very short, um, the boring part, and then I'll, I'll let uh, Stan and Leo talk about the exciting pieces. Um, so next slide, please, Stan. Who are we? Um, so the Pacific Community, SPC, is the Pacific region's principal scientific and technical organization. Um, we're an international development organization that is owned and governed by its 27 members, uh, which includes 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. Um, our work supports the sustainable development aspirations of our members uh, through the application of science, research, and technology. Uh, and we're mandated by our members to provide leadership in data and statistics for the Pacific region. Um, next slide, please. So for over 75 years, we've served our members in several sectors, including fisheries management, um, population statistics, public health uh, and education, uh, and also in cross-cutting thematic areas such as climate change, um, our ocean and the blue economy, uh, food systems, and gender equality. Now, I'm working with our members for many, many decades. We've amassed a rich collection of data and information about the Pacific. Um, yeah, so um, 
well, this is the first time we've used the slide, just the representation of the um, EEZ boundaries of the countries. Um, data visualization, spatial data visualization for us is a, is a big um, capability area that we're looking to expand and, and, and um, enhance the tools that we provide to, uh, I guess, enhance the utility of the, the geospatial data sets that we have in our catalog. Um, but uh, that's a nice image there, we thought, because it shows the, the coverage of um, you know, the scope of work that we're doing in, in, in the region. The Pacific is, is a big place. Uh, and you've got a list of uh, our members there on the left with uh, both our metropolitan countries like Australia, uh, the US, the UK, uh, New Zealand, um, and also uh, the Pacific Island countries and territories. Next slide, please, um, Stan. Oh, I jumped too early. That's okay. So, so the Pacific Data Hub is SBC's strategic response to ensuring that we are managing the region's data resources as well. Um, and that we can continue to uh, make this valuable resource available for public good. Uh, our program of work recognizes the important role that we play as data stewards for the Pacific uh, and ensuring that we must continue to evolve and respond to the changing um, development, social, economic and environmental challenges that our members face. Uh, so we're aiming to provide access to the most comprehensive collection of timely and reliable data about the Pacific to inform better policy development and decision-making for the Pacific. So why do we need a regional data infrastructure? Uh, and as I've stated in the slide here, ma managing data and implementing and sustaining data infrastructure uh, in severely resource constrained or challenged environments is hard, it's, it's tough work. Next slide, please. The, the challenges in providing access to timely and reliable data in the Pacific for small island developing states are multifaceted. Um, I've listed some of the challenges we see uh, in our regional organizations and with our member states. I'm not gonna go into each of these challenges in detail. Uh, and this is certainly not a um, exhaustive list, uh, but it's some of the more common challenges we find to be true uh, in the environments that we operate in. Uh, next slide, please. So we believe we are uniquely positioned to address these challenges. Uh, we're leveraging partnerships and encouraging greater coordination and fostering um, meaningful collaboration to collectively tackle these challenges uh, and to create more opportunities for realizing value from our data resources. We're providing a regional data infrastructure that can be um, sustained for the long-term beyond the short-term funding horizons of development and aid projects uh, that, that typically fund uh, data initiatives in the Pacific region. And this approach enables us to take a longer term and holistic view uh, in how we tackle these challenges, how we develop and build data capability that can benefit the region. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Pacific Data Program is a data management capability strengthening initiative. Uh, that seeks to provide a comprehensive evidence base of data and information to inform better policy development and decision making in the Pacific region. Um, the Pacific Data Hub has been established as an integrated program of work within SPC uh, that supports our cross cutting flagship programs. Uh, it's leveraging resources from across the organization, uh, including systems, uh, shared processes, people, expertise, uh, and relationships. Uh, to bring data to the fore in, the, in addressing the most um, important development, social envir and envir environmental challenges that our member countries and territories face. Uh, again, the Pacific Data Hub is SBC's strategic response to the, the challenges and opportunities that we face in managing data as a valuable resource for the region. Um, it's also recognition of the important role uh, SBC and its members play as data stewards. Um, the, uh, the data hub also provides a platform for that data stewardship to evolve and mature. Uh, it provides a, a vehicle for investment in a sustainable data infrastructure, uh, which includes our data processes, our governance mechanisms, uh, policies, systems, technology, people, and, and importantly, um, sustainable funding. Uh, it provides a governance framework to ensure that data um, with the data assets under our care can be used and reused to uh, not only maximize value and impact, 
um, but also to ensure that the data is used responsibly and ethically. Um, our program is ambitious, um, but we believe it's uh, necessary. And we've set out to deliver a comprehensive, uh, robust and enduring data infrastructure um, as a regional public good. Um, so yeah, the slide here, uh, it, it uh, depicts the three sort of broad capability areas that uh, we work across. So data management and, and governance, technology and innovation, outreach and engagement. Um, so the Pacific Data Program is building capability in data management and data governance, and establishing and maintaining trust in data and in how we manage and share data. Um, we're also providing the digital tools and data management platforms and exploring innovative ways to enhance the accessibility, um, utility and value of data. Uh, and we're also about empowering people and giving them the confidence and the knowledge to use data to innovate. Um, to solve problems uh, and to inspire positive change. And that's it from me. I'll hand over to Stan to talk a bit about the infrastructure. Malo Stan. Good morning. So I'm Stan, I'm storage and architect of uh, Pacific Data. I'm going to talk about infrastructure and data flows happening uh, in our platform. So just a global overview of the platform itself. We have at the center here in Luga Pacific Data Hub, uh, which is a mix of Drupal and CCAM. And the main component being the CCAM catalog where all the metadata is uh, discoverable. And this CCAM uh, instance is connecting to many different uh, sources. So on the right here, you can see the external sources. Um, like there, it's a few of them that actually there's a bit more. It's prep is an environmental uh, data hub uh, based on ECAN, HDX, the humanitarian data exchange is a CCAN catalog. Ocean Info Hub is a ODIS graph database. Um, the government of UK and now is a uh, based on open data source. So there's a very variety of other uh, data hubs we are harvesting from. Or Excuse me, Stan, would you mind holding the mic up a bit closer to your mouth? Because you're cutting in and out. Thank you. Uh, is it is it better? So, um, awesome. okay. So on the right, external sources, but we also have our own uh, infrastructure to uh, store data, so it's below. We can divide this infrastructure into uh, spaces like the data exploration tools, and we will go more in detail later on, and the data layer where we are, the data actually sits. And we have a uh, set of uh, applications and databases depending on the type of data. And the first slide was a simplification of that overview. This kind of shows the kind of data flows we have between all those uh, those platforms. So now I'm going a bit more in details in in data flows depending on the type of data we uh, we have. So for instance, documents or reports, PDFs mostly, uh, we can store them in seek and store it directly. And we also have an internal digital library at SPC. Uh, which we harvest from uh, geospatial data. So uh, we use currently use GeoServer and GeoNode as a front end. We also have a few threads server for more scientific data. And geospatial data can be viewed in both uh, the Seekan catalog uh, and also from the Pacific map, which I show earlier. Or used in dashboards, uh, like the maritime dashboard, I will show that also later. We have uh, uh, DotStat, uh, which is uh, uh, built and maintained by the OECD, and that's used for indicators that are such as the Sustainable Development Goals, and that platform is uh, maintained by the Statistics Division. 
at its PC. And of course, we can hold any kind of uh, structured data, um, like the microdata here, but microdata comes from sensors and surveys. And we have a specific platform for that, again, maintained by statistic division. So let's uh, deep dive a bit into uh, data flows and uh, user journey. So, as, so users can start from the, the Pacific Data uh, catalog directly searching from da for data sets and publications. Looking for a specific kind of data, they can use any data exploration tools what we have, that's the part in blue below. So Pacific Map, GeoNode for special uh, uh, geospatial data, the PICOS website, which is uh, really focused on the ocean science uh, data models, pdh.stat for all kinds of indicators uh, in the Pacific, microdata for serves, uh, census and survey, digital library for all kinds of reports. But what is probably more interesting for end users is to start with a dashboard, so looking at a specific topic. So they want to look at SDGs across the Pacific, then we go to the stat, um, Sustainable Development Goals dashboard. We'll, we want to know about more about maritime boundaries, we will start in the maritime boundaries dashboard, and so on and so forth. And we have many dashboards, and we build uh, more and more every, every now and then. What is interesting here is that to see that both data exploration and dashboards both connect to the same source of truth in the data layer. They can also connect, it's not, uh, you cannot see it here, but they can also connect to external sources, which I listed before, spread, uh, OIH, and, and so on. Few examples I'll try to go quickly. Um, so this prep, which as mentioned, is a partner, a long time uh, partner with uh, SPC. It's focused on the environment uh, data sets. So we harvest uh, from them into the, uh, we harvest the metadata to the CCAN catalog. And from them, once into the CCAN catalog, it can be reused in dashboards or even viewed in the, in the Pacific map application. PICOS catalog, that's the other way around. Um, they have uh, servers, threads of servers, holding the, uh, the scientific data. But those servers do not provide any metadata. So they built a, a Drupal website uh, with the help of Team Digital, by the way. Uh, uh, and they the, the idea is to build a catalog about their, their ocean science data. And once it's in there, CCAN is harvesting from the Drupal website because it now has a, a clear and precise metadata, which is all what matters in CCAN, really. Education Policy Bank, that's another case. This, this time we start from the SPC Digital Library. We harvest CCAN. And would be the portal. So a portal or a dashboard really focused on the education uh, policy topic. Population dashboard. This time we use dot stat as the uh, data source and it goes both way, both ways. It's harvested by CCAN, so it shows and it's discoverable in our catalog. It's also used directly into Power BI. And actually, this one has been built by Leo and Nicole in using Power BI. Uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so, again, coming from .stat, and we have quite a few pages showing all kind of charts for every goal, every target in the, in the BSDB. VSDGs. So. Maritime Boundaries Ponsa Dashboard. So this time it's using uh, geospatial data. And I'm going maybe to quickly show it looks. This one. 
So this one gets shows all the boundaries in the Pacific and treaties and so on. It shows the status of those treaties. So there's quite a lot of uh, um, information in this in this portal. So this is just the main page, but you can click on any country and see every detail. While I'm here, I, I could show the SDG dashboard as well quickly. This is a um, chart generated from data coming from DotStat with uh, the now very famous progress wheel, again developed by uh, Think Digital. And if you click on a specific topic, you can see the contribution by any country, every country, and then for every target, uh, some kind of uh, charts showing all the details. I mean, different kind of charts depending on the, on the target we're looking at. We also import data from existing uh, uh, programs and, and, and websites, because sometimes there are two or three years programs that are going to an end, and we need to get the data back into uh, CCAN so we can make sure it's still uh, live and, and still online. So all those things, of course, uh, to build all these things, we did face a few challenges. So I'm going to list a few uh, ones. In all data, while we try to promote open data, uh, some data sets need to be restricted because they are a bit sensitive. Uh, luckily, CCAN does offer uh, a workflow for this kind of request. So the data is still discoverable through metadata from the catalog, but users can request access uh, to the data only. So this is a fairly simple workflow here. Send, user sends a request, data owner receives the email, and the owner confirms or denies, and then the user gets a, a link to the data. That works great as long as the data is in CCAN, is in directly in CCAN store, but when, because we have all those sources, uh, data sources, uh, sometimes we need the user to go to directly to the other source. So we're still working on trying to improve the user experience with that. Uh, harvesters. So initially we did use uh, CCAN harvesters, but because the sources keep changing, we have uh, fairly high maintenance and we need to react quickly because you never know when it's going to break. And we finally decided to come up with a, a, a separate app, which is Python Flask app. And so we run our harvesters from there and it's easier for us to maintain and monitor. So you can quickly see here on the screenshot, there's a, quite a few indicators. We see what's happening when it has run, when it has failed and so on. Uh, on the same application, actually, we do monitor metadata. Because one of the big challenge uh, in our case is to make sure that metadata is actually of good quality, coming data coming from so many various sources. So we have this dashboard that shows uh, what kind of data we have, and how much, uh, how many fields are filled for each uh, data set, and we of course trying to. Uh, improve the user experience uh, as as we go and kind of uh, through an agile process starting with the user focus survey uh, looking at uh, analytics getting some user feedbacks and and then updating the website and, and redesigning pages and dashboards and so on thank you i'm going to stop here um, maybe before we jump to uh, to Leo for the data introduction, if you have any questions. Uh, I, I definitely too. I can't see any hands, um, so I will jump in and be selfish with my questions. Um, so I think uh, I think Stan, like your overview shows a pretty deep technical ecosystem of different solutions to build the, the data infrastructure for. Pacific community. Um, and so you kind of talked a bit about coming together and, and meeting the challenges of the community. 
and the leadership, I guess, that um, Pacific, the SPC had to sort of like come forward with. I find that really interesting because I think when other jurisdictions uh, with their data catalogs come together, they might not have the same sort of challenges. So they, they, they're, coming, they're coming together around an open data declaration or a pro policy or a program. It's very much supply side from the government's perspective. Whereas SPC has kind of identified these challenges of all the community members, um, you know, it's too difficult or too expensive or too challenging. Um, where would they all start to, to meet uh, the needs of, of their, just their own sort of area to publish their data sets? So the leadership that was required is like a true ecosystem understanding. And um, I, I guess what lessons could those other jurisdictions learn uh, in terms of aggregating or bringing together the needs of so many parties? Is, is it similar to bringing together government agencies for a jurisdiction? You think? Yeah, it's fraught with challenges. Um, the even approach we we chose to take, um, because there there are always questions around sovereignty. What about my data? Where is it stored? Who's benefiting from it? Those types of questions they always come up every time we talk to our members. Well, I think I guess we're we've been in a fortunate position as because we've been the default data stewards on behalf of our members for, for so many decades, we already have the data. We already sit on the data and we're trusted. We've earned that trust over that time. Um, and by us embarking on this program of work uh, to strengthen uh, data, um, data management capability, it is starting to raise all these questions. You know, if we'd done nothing, or, or or said nothing and did some of the work anyway. And, and, um, none of the, the these yeah, that there wouldn't have been so many questions and eyebrows brows raised. But I think it's important for us to, to be transparent and upfront about what what we're doing. Yeah, you know, where where is uh, you know which data centers are, are are the infrastructure being hosted on, and where, where the, the data is transiting through. Um, <clears throat> and these are necessary. Uh, questions to raise and, and conversations to have with our stakeholders uh, because that's how you build trust in yeah? having those those uh, frank and honest discussions with them um, even having frank and honest discussions about their own capability and and where they can best invest their time and resources rather than focus on building and maintaining infrastructure focus on the data and how, how to use the data, how to analyze the data and you know, what, what sort of impact you, you're hoping to achieve with the data. Because they, um, we see this time here, not just in the data space, but um, retention of, of, of um, people with the necessary skills to do highly technical work. That's a, it's a huge problem in the Pacific. Um, we're always training and doing capacity building because people uh, move on to better, better opportunities once they're trained. Uh, and that that's not a problem that's going to go away uh, anytime soon. So we we believe having the centralized uh, model is how we can best uh, uh, address those challenges. Of course, some of our members want to have their own infrastructure and we're fully supportive of that. Um, one of our partners, in fact, Sprep, which um, Stan mentioned before, the, the uh, environmental um, agency, their approach was to build out um, country-owned portals um, that they manage centrally. Uh, and that worked for, the, the, for that group of stakeholders. It worked very well, in fact, uh, because they're, they're, they're working with one sector, one ministry uh, or one agency in the government. It wouldn't have worked for us because we, we deal with many sectors and many ministries and many, many, uh, across many sectors. Um, so our approach is to centralize, work through our relationships, establish relationships that we have in our technical divisions, uh, and that trust that they already have, um, because they, yeah, we already have this inherent trust. Why well, wouldn't we um, use that that as, as a strength uh, to to take this forward, this data, um, these data initiatives forward? I'll stop there talking too much. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll go to Claire, but it's kind of obvious that um, SPC is not only taking the steward role or the publisher role or the you know, infrastructure manager role, you're also taking the intermediary role of um, how do we communicate this data through dashboards and ensure that the value of it not just being published, but 
available in a consumable, digestible format is there. So I think that's super important. I think that value chain that's there for that portal and for all your different implementations for different um, data sources um, creates a lot of value for the ecosystem again. Um, but yeah, Claire, did you have a question? What did you drop? No, there you are. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you guys for a really, really great presentation. Um, we actually modeled a lot of our repository structure on your um, format because we do, so we do scientific research and we try and share it um, both for scientists and for the public. Um, and we are also a, a, a UN academic sustainable development goal hub for clean water and sanitation. So that is one of our uh, key goals is trying to address not just SDG six, but how we support the other SDGs. So there's two questions I had, um, and I may have missed this in the presentation, I apologize, but I did notice you guys in your infrastructure had a thread server in which you were delivering data as well. So can you just maybe uh, mention how, what kind of data you're serving on your thread server? So we have, an, for example, so we have an open app server, we're using URDAP um, as our open app server, which I understand threads is a, is a different type of open app. Yeah, I was going to ask Stan, you can take that one. <laughs> and I know we, we, we're using threads, uh, I, I wouldn't say unusual way, but in a challenging way. We haven't chosen the, the easiest path because of the um, irregular grid arrays that we work with. But I'll stop there and let Stan talk about it. He knows more about this than I do. Uh, so before I try to answer, uh... Uh, please know that we are not specialists uh, of uh, this kind of data, and that's why we rely on uh, our divisions uh, to serve the, the data. So the, the threads server we've set up with the PICOS uh, team is uh, to um, disseminate data models that they created themselves. And so you should have a look, at maybe, maybe if you have a look at the, the PICOS website, website which is I think because we will send the link in the chat there's the ocean catalog which is directly connected to both spreads server and there's uh, some map views based on the effects and they uh, they, sh they the idea is to sh to show a preview of those models that are hosted on the threads servers uh now i won't I can't spend too much talking about threads because threads is not an easy one to maintain. It might, we had we had to face many challenges. We tried many different um, inf uh, setups in kind of infrastructure. Um, yeah, is that is that enough of an answer for you, uh, Claire? Or do you want more? Yeah, and the, the link is great. Thank you. So. Um... Right. So one of the things our group does is we're climate modelers. We have a climate modeling section. We do global climate models. And I think that sounds like kind of what the group, the PCOS group that you're doing, um, those are the kind of things they're trying to address. Mm. And it looked like yeah. you might have like a visualization piece as well, which is what I was really interested in because that is a real challenge with trying to show the general public how climate data actually relates to real world information, for example. Um, and then for your SDG work, you have your SDG dashboard on your Drupal front end. Um, so is that, that is one of the sections in your diagram, your, your architectural diagram you show? Like, so where does the SDG data come from that you've sort of amalgamated and show summaries of on your front page? Right, so the SDGs are stored in the dot .stat uh, uh, application. So dot .stat is all its kind of database for indicators. And okay. there's both backend and front end. So, uh, so the SDG dashboard and the high charts, actually, uh, we used the JavaScript uh, library we used is connected directly to dot .stat. Uh, well, actually, no, right now there's a uh, goes through Drupal because we have some kind of cache system. So Drupal connects to .stat to get the data directly from the .stat as 
uh, SDNX and then trans transforms it for the high charts uh, library. Anyway, uh, again, it's another story of uh, who maintains the data, and the data is maintained by uh, our SDG expert within the statistics division at SPC. And she she uh, works closely with oh, every country. All right, thank you guys, and thank you for the presentation. Cool. Um, but yeah, we should learn about the the database challenge. Um, and I, I just also mentioned we do do some additional work with the thread stuff connecting into the climate data um, portal for New South Wales government as well. And I guess it, it, it's you know each each thread server might have a unique data model and a data feed, as it were. So the the way that you make that accessible and discoverable on a, on something like a CCAM portal might be just an endpoint, or it might be kind of you know, published sort of packages of, of of data coming from that thread server. So getting that mapped out and sort of published across is part of a design process, I guess. Um, Leo, did you want to talk about the database challenge? We're going to run out of time. I have to talk about OGP stuff. As well. <laughs> yes, of course. I want to talk about the database challenge, guys. So um, hello, everyone. Um, I will try to be short, and so we can have time for some questions, if you have. Um, so I'm a data analyst at uh, SPC. I'm working with, uh, quite closely with, uh, quite close with uh, CEO and Stan, and uh, they're, they're in my team for, for, for organizing this challenge. And we see, which is, uh, who is already on the, in the call, is also a co-organizer co -organizer, sorry, for this challenge. So, um, Brief life into Pacific data, uh, which is our slogan for this uh, database challenge this year. Please, Tan, can you go to the next slide? So I will try to give you the uh, most important information of this challenge. Um, so it's running from the 1st of September to the 31. And our goal it is, is, is to raise awareness um, about Pacific data. And um, but it's open for everyone and it's free. Uh, you can participate uh, uh, quite easily. And you can win up to $5,000. So the first price is $5,000. But you have to know we have two categories. Uh, one is uh, interactive data viz, and one other is static data viz. So for the interactive data viz, we are thinking about uh, dashboards and all this stuff you can do with uh, Python and R and all of the tools you can use. And for the static data viz, um, we think about um, a poster, for instance, and uh, when you use Illustrator, um, even sometimes a, a nice PDF file, uh, whatever you want to, to produce, we are really open-minded about that. And this year, we have a special theme, uh, which I can't reveal uh, yet because the uh, our official launch is tomorrow. So we will reveal the, the theme tomorrow and the data sets uh, provided this year. So we will have four data sets provided uh, based on this theme. And you have to use at least one data set um, to produce your database, but you can also use one of the data set or several data sets if you want from your own area. Um, so it depends on where you work and on, you, on your inspiration as well. And uh, the four criteria for the judges are design, uh, storytelling, innovation, and the technical solution uh, you will provide. Um, yep, I think that's all. Just to, yes, maybe few information more, a uh, few more information. We we have um, a launch conference uh, next Tuesday um, in, in Numea, uh, but it will be physical. But if you want to see it, we'll have a replay uh, just, after, just after the launch conference. And uh, we will organize a webinar as well. Um, even if you don't participate at the challenge, you can attend um, this webinar because we'll have uh, four data stars invited uh, to this webinar. It will be on the 11th of September, and this time it will be online and interpreted in English and French, both. Um, so I'm more interested for English people. Um, and yep, um, you can find all the information. Maybe you can share my screen to show, uh, to show you um, our website as well. OK. Um... Can you see my screen? Yep. OK, so this is our website. So thanks to, to Stan for this uh, wonderful website. Um, so here, yes, it's 
just the main information about the launch conf launch conference. You have the the prices as well here. Uh, the rules, uh, if you want to, particip to participate, uh, some news, videos, and articles with uh, our best presenter um, presentation uh, with uh, WC, and uh, the contest timeline. Okay, so it's open to submissions starting tomorrow uh, with the launch conference, then the webinar, and then the yes, we have to close the application on the at the end of September, and the prize ceremony will be at the beginning of October. Okay. Uh, but you can also follow us um, on the social networks because we have a Twitter um, page. And uh, I advise you as well to follow the LinkedIn page if you want to follow all the information uh, because uh, this one is more popular, but uh, you can follow both of them. And we have also a Facebook page if you want to follow it. Uh, it's um, always Pacific Database Challenge if you want to find it. Um, yep. That's all, uh, guys, for me. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I will be um, really happy to answer it. Um, awesome. Um, but yeah, I, my only question is, uh, what, what do you expect this year um, that will improve from last year? Because last year was pretty awesome, I thought, in terms of the applicants, um, the, the spread of people who got involved. Um, and actually just the quality of how it was all run. I was really impressed with how you, how you folks ran it. It's a good question. Uh, this year, uh, we want to have more, participant, more participants um, because we have bigger bigger prices. And so we try to gather more interest um, on this database challenge. And this year, we hired a, a, com a communication company as well. Um, so it's easier to manage all this uh, stuff around communication on this challenge. So yeah, more more interest. Um, I think uh, maybe more participants as well, more submissions, and uh, more qualitative submissions as well. Uh, we want to to target the yeah the yes people with good skills on data visualizations and with bigger prices, uh, bigger prices like the five thousand dollars first price. I think uh, we try to to reach out this uh, this uh, objective. Uh, hi, hi everybody. Just uh, if uh, I can complete uh, Leo's words uh, for this year, we, as we have chosen a, a special theme, uh, we think that it will help people to just focus more on uh, certain data sets because last year it was open and uh, they could take any data sets from our open data portals. So uh, this year we have four data sets, so two from provided by the SPC and two by the government. And um, actually, I can't wait to reveal all the data sets because they are really, really great. And uh, we really hope that people will really uh, uh, like do the most out of it and the highlights uh, uh, new maybe things about our data. And uh, I thought actually, uh, Leo, we wanted to reveal the theme today just with all the live people. Shouldn't oh. we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, maybe. Maybe it's going to be uh, displayed, yeah, because yeah, it's going to be displayed out. tonight on the yeah. on the social media. So, uh, um, okay. I, I just let you tell. <laughs> okay, so awesome. let's let's review the the film for this year. Uh, it will be about about around food and uh, food security and uh, food system, all this stuff, because we think um, it's a topic really important for the Pacific, but also for for the world. And uh, yes, the four data sets will be based on food. And so we have data about uh, New Caledonian food, but uh, as well around the Pacific food. So yeah, um, and to answer the question on the chat, um, the four required data sets are not already on the website, so you can't find them yet. And uh, but maybe it will be available uh, tomorrow. Uh, so yeah. Um, so just stay awesome. tuned. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So stay tuned, and uh, yeah, and, and I hope you you will find some time to participate on at this challenge because uh, yeah, this year uh, you can win a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, well, I'm going to have to jump across to this OGP stuff just quickly. Um, if folks can hang on for at least four minutes, I'll, I will try and run through it quickly. Um, and I will I'll leverage the prior speakers' topics in um, kind of covering it. So um, basically, where are we? 
Yes, Talon. Um, yeah, so Open Knowledge Event um, is on the 4th of September. Then the Digital Summit for Talon is on the 5th of September. Open Government Partnership, 6th and 7th of September. The Australians in the room, that's super important because Australia is working on its National Action Plan number three. Uh, and there's a process ongoing at the moment um, that is uh, ready for people to contribute into. But it's relevant for everyone, like what is OGP? And that's kind of what I wanted to just raise as a topic today. Um, and also Mel, who was who spoke last month and she was going to talk this month, but is super busy. Uh, she's got a side event also at um, OGP in Talon on the 8th of September. Uh, she might be back next month or the month after to talk about Make You Open as well. But what is OGP? I think this is relevant for everyone and it kind of connects with what we just went through and particularly my question to CEO. So what is OGP all about? It's connecting and enabling the, a growing community of reformers and champions from government and civil society to take action together. So collective action. So that question to CEO about how did um, SPC recognize they need to take leadership um, and kind of represent on behalf of the member communities and sort of build infrastructure. I think that's super important. And I think also the data viz challenge in the way that, um, you know, something like GovHack and the data viz challenges, things like this are about raising awareness of what's available in terms of data and uh, connecting with consumers of that data with the hope that they'll become intermediaries as well, that they'll help to communicate the value of the open data sets. They'll, they'll raise more awareness and therefore set more preferences for people to come into those portals and actually consume the data as well. And I think all of this is fundamentally about open government. It's, it's a question of all open societies. You know, how do, we, how do we see through the fog of war as we live our lives and we connect with the, our communities and we're challenged by certain things like climate or food security or whatever it might be? How do we get through that? And the answer is pretty much through data whether it's scientific research or whether it's just organizational um, attunement to what they're doing in program activities and how they publish the results of those activities as data. Um, all of that is how we kind of cut through and understand things in, a, in a, as much as possible an objective manner. Um, there's so much intersubjective belief that can come through things like um, fashions and trends and disinformation and misinformation in, in culture and society. We really need this somewhat objective data published by trusted institutions to allow us to get a clear picture of what is actually going on in the world. So for me, I think OGP is really, um, we recognize that open data comes from a supply side, government and, and large institutions like SPC will supply data or aggregate the supply of data. Um, we'll have intermediaries like Link Digital who will work in the space between and try and improve the way that that data is made available, machine readable, accessible, discoverable, um, and kind of focus, have a niche, and that's what we do. Um, but on the demand side, it's not just con consumption. It's not just how do we do something data busy on top of data. What do we actually demand from our data? It comes down to kind of fundamental questions about what is it we want from society? Like how do we want safer communities? How do we want more protected risk-free uh, or risk-mitigated futures when it comes to things like food security or climate change? Um, and the answer is, you know, we need to come together and, and basically have collective action generate that demand. Without the demand side of open data, it's very hard for supply to really fine tune the way that they deliver and meet that demand. So OGP, from the way I'm reading it, the way I'm optimistically going into it is, is, is around that. Um, as putting myself forward as more of a civil society side of the thing. Um, I am an intermediary. I'm working in the, the space between the two, but um, as a co-student of CCAN, I'm, I'm super keen to understand how we can generate more data demand. How do we, how do we really bring institutions in the, in the civil society together and have them collectively agree what they need from government or what they need from big business or what they need from um, large representative organizations like SPC. So with that, again, back to Australians, um, Attorney Generals is running the process at the moment that they're carrying the process for the National Action Plan for Australia. The National Action Plan you know, in your country will also be up every couple of years. So this is still relevant for everyone else. In Australia, the kinds of issues that we're discussing uh, listed there. Digital transformation, um, you know, hot topic items like AI, which come with all sorts of things like ethics, consent and agreement, 
anti corruption, like the standard of um, you know government and making sure government is good. Uh, service delivery in terms of how we equitably deliver services to all members of communities uh, through government service delivery. Um, budgetary efficiency, efficiencies and making sure we don't spend tax dollars money poorly. Um, public safety, all the, all the normal stuff you imagine, we essentially uh, offshore to government or in, inshore, I should say, with um, sovereignty to our own government. We trust them to do these things and they need to reciprocate and do it openly so that we can kind of audit and be comfortable with the way that they're doing it. And um, that, that ensures ongoing trust. So the consultation is open. Um, it is a pretty short consultation process. Um, it's only a couple of days left. To give you the heads up, it's super easy. It doesn't look too troublesome for anyone to contribute into. These are the sorts of questions they ask, these five um, across three different areas. So public participation and engagement. You know, do you support the working group's approach? What's one problem relating to public participation? And then that one that I bolded there, what's a specific action? This is where it's coming down to. The National Action Plan is a list of actions that they, the government will plan to do um, in, largely in, in combination with civil society over the, 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 the future years. And then we'll report back to OGP and to how it's going. So what is the specific action you might wanna put forward? And then it's validating. How could the impact of this um, be measured um, and what approaches and things like that? Same sort of questions basically for two other thematic areas, government and corporate sec uh, sector integrity. Um, again, the, the, the crux is they're looking for actions and then strengthening, strengthening democratic processes. Um, I think I've talked a bit, mentioned a bit in the past and even just earlier today about disinformation, misinformation, what that does to erode trust in public institutions, which are so, so important because without, you know, trust in say uh, judicial processes or trust in public institutions, uh, society just fractures more and more. Um, you can't really operate in good faith with your fellow citizens if you think that there's some sort of third party, um, uh, you know, poorly sort of um, run uh, intermediary working to hold you together as a society. So government, um, whether it's uh, on the law side of law and order or whether it's on the side of just standard government uh, spending money to provide services. We need to trust those institutions. Um, and then lastly, the co-creation process. This is the last sort of area of questioning that's in this uh, process. They published this uh, infographic. It's basically what we're in the middle of at the moment, this deliberation and consultation. It is very fast because, you know, Australia, we almost missed the chance. Uh, I think we had to get a, an extension maybe for the second or third time in order to submit the NAP before we got kicked out of the whole OGP. But we're there, we're ticking boxes. By December this year, we need to have it submitted to OGP. So this accelerated process is to, is to get us back on track. Um, and yeah, I'll be there next week um, and then participating, learning about collective action. I really want to kind of bring what I learned back into forums like this, um, projects like um, uh, the CCAM project, uh, and forward-looking mission for Link Digital, how we operate as a corporate entity, I think is obviously connected to how societies should be formed into the future and what kind of good actors you have in the commercial space. We do have a business model, we do make money, we do pay for staff, but ultimately we create value and that is measured in the context of society, not on a balance sheet, not in profit and loss, right? Um, so then after that, um, I'll be in Toronto, so will Mark, uh, I think he's already traveling, but uh, he'll be there. We're hosting an event with the Canadian Open Data Society and that should be really fun. Um, I might talk about all the kind of stuff I just waffled on about. Um, I'll be super excited from all the conversations in Tallinn. And for those who can make it um, physically uh, in Toronto, there's the link uh, and this deck will be shared. And then lastly, on our YouTube channel, public forum number one with Peer and uh, <laughs> Ambiguity. Uh, you can catch that one now. It goes for about an hour. And uh, yeah, 13 minutes in is Amber, 26 minutes in I think is Pia, uh, and her presentation is super cool. So grab that one. And then a general call out. We do have CCAN installations, but um, for those who missed it, the CCAN um, installations are things like extensions and how to do your dev environment. They're also up, uh, posted up there recently as well on our YouTube channel. 
uh, and this will be there as well. So there's a bit of an inception moment for those watching this on YouTube and hearing me talk about it, because there you are. Uh, and then next week, uh, Jamie, not 100% confirmed, kind of confirmed, but then I realized I got the dates wrong. Uh, so it's the 28th, um, I think, when she wakes up and she might confirm. But Kate as well, she's put together a uh, podcast recently. She's been pumping out some really good interviews. And um, she's the Chief Data and Insights Officer at UNSW here in Australia. Go check out her podcast, Data Revolution Tech. Um, she'll be coming along to have a chat um, just generally about data and whatever she wants to cover because she's got a lot she can talk about. Jamie working with Deloitte, but she worked with the OGP uh, when Canada was um, co-chair. Uh, and she's worked in the open government space uh, in BC as well as federal in, Can in Canada, which is currently with um, Deloitte. Um, new paper, talk about that. Very similar to the ONDC Foundation 4 from, if you look, you can follow the link and have a look. It's very similar, all about um, capability building, data literacy skills, all that kind of stuff in government institutions. And boy, I ran through that quick. Uh, any hands? I did go over, but you know. I was late to start. Um, too much of a whirlwind. Too many hands. They're all they're all off off in the um in the dust. <laughs> just just a comment from me, I guess. Um, Stephen on OGP. Um, of our Pacific Island country and territory members, only. Papua New Guinea is um, a member of uh, OGP, yep. so it would be nice to see other uh, the other Pacific Islands uh, looking to or considering to sign up for OGP as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Australia is not really doing great. I, it's a process, and it's I wouldn't say it's a difficult process, but it requires kind of like longevity and thought and action and planning. And it's not really a, it's not easy to run as a political, you know, a political flag. It's not going to win your votes. It's not, you know, no. and I think at different times, different governments might say, yes, we're doing our GP because it's an easy thing to promote themselves through. But then there's a change of government and things change and no one really cares anymore. I think that's, that's the good thing about it. That's meant to be the good thing about it. It's meant to be ongoing, right? But it, may, it means that it's hard for a government to just, pick it up as a political win, um, which means it, it just it immediately starts as a cost center. And I think that's a, that's a telling point around uh, you know, supply versus demand. If there's no civil sector demanding that their local government get involved with OGP, the, the wins for a local government is not really massive. Um, it ends up being a political win, that's it, um, subject to all those issues. So I, I think, yeah, I, for me, the time right now, the next generation of open data, the revolution, whatever it is, it's on the demand side. I think we need to be asking questions around AI, about trust and consent of um, our informational goods, what can be consumed that we've generated as humans over the last you know, X thousand years that should be trained and, and turned into a, like almost like an intersubjective in a box that will make things for us. How much do we trust that? Um, how much do we want to allow for that to happen? Um, and, and all of these things uh, from a demand side, we, we really need to rally people together because I don't think there's a problem with government trying to supply data or ethics or you know, good guidance or good governance. Government is more than willing to do that. Um, but as a society, there is a, there is a challenge in us knowing exactly what we want, being self-aware and sort of you know, prepared to work for our for our um for our values. Yeah. Um I will if it if I see Papua New Guinea, I will talk to the delegates and I'll say congratulations. We'll get more people on board, right? I believe they're in a similar situation where um they signed up and it was all go, 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 and then it um uh, interest sort of waned. And there are a number of commitments that they've signed up for that they haven't delivered on, so they're they're picking that up uh, again as well. Yeah. Cool. Um. Well, we should wrap it up because yes, because I started late. We're now over, over time by twelve minutes. I apologise to everyone for not being ready to record. Um. But thanks for coming.